So are we all set up to record? Are we ready to go? Ready to rock. All right. Excellent. I'm Jim Weirich. I'm from a company called Neo, and uh, we are a Rails development firm. We do lots of Ruby there. We also do lots of JavaScript and uh, trying to get into the closure uh, market just a little bit as well. Um, we are <coughs> excuse me. We are worldwide. We have off we have eight offices all over the world as far as Singapore and South America and over in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. So we are all over the place. Um, and I'm here to talk about Ruby Motion. Now this is the Coco Devs uh, user group. Is that correct? So I'm assuming you are all Coco developers. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. So you guys know this Coco stuff way better than I do. I am um, I am a full-blown Ruby guy. I've been doing Ruby now for 13 years getting close to 13 years now, uh, and I really like that. I've not done much iOS programming at all. Now, of, of the Cocoa developers here, how many people are iOS developers as opposed, as opposed to Mac developers? So most people are iOS developers. Good. Uh, how many people have uh, no Ruby? Mm, okay, about half with, with some hands like this. Okay, so maybe we'll do a little bit of Ruby review as well. That's kind of what I expected. I expected this crowd to be really strong in the Coco iOS department and maybe not so strong in the, in the, the Ruby department. And that's okay. We've, uh, we'll prepare for that. So Ruby Motion, what it is, it is Ruby for the iOS device. It is a commercial product. You can go to rubymotion.com and you can purchase it there. This is the lowdown. These are the details you probably need to know. Uh, it is a commercial product. You do have to pay for it. It's $200 for the initial thing. Uh, sometimes they have sales uh, um, on it as well. Uh, it is essentially Ruby that runs on an iOS device. You write a Ruby program, slightly modified Ruby program, we'll get into that in a second, and that Ruby program is not interpreted. It compiles down to LLVM bytecodes that run directly on your iOS device. The binaries it produces are doggone close to exactly the same binaries that you would get by writing in Objective-C. So there's very, very, very little overhead involved in using Ruby Motion on an iOS device. You're not going to suffer any, any significant performance losses just by using it. Um, so with that in mind, okay, so also it's command line oriented. It's all designed to work from the command line. You type things at the command line and it runs from there. So it is not IDE based. Now that being said, there are some IDEs for it. And I can't really speak too much to that because I am a command line guy myself. So I really, really like this approach. Uh, other people will think I'm weird. Um, you do need Xcode to run. So, so what do you need to actually use Ruby code? Well, obviously, you need the Ruby Motion product itself. You need to have an installation of Ruby on your Mac. Uh, probably a recent release like 1.9 or 2.0 would be a good choice for that. That's because the build tools are themselves written in Ruby that run on the Mac. So you need a version of Ruby for the Mac. Uh, you'll need uh, um, Xcode itself uh, for the libraries and the SDK and whatnot. And if you wish to deploy on a real hardware device, you're going to need um, uh, Apple license as well. So, uh, you know, you guys know that already if you're Apple developers, you're iOS developers. So that's, that's um, uh, that. It was developed by Laurent Sansonetti. Laurent is uh, an ex-Apple employee, and he is one of the lead developers on Mac Ruby that uh, is designed to work on the Mac, it compiles uh, on the Mac, and uses the Mac libraries directly. And uh, he was developing it at Apple. About two years ago, Apple kind of lost interest in having competing programming environments on their platform, or at least supporting them directly. So they kind of shut down um, really any overt support for the Mac Ruby thing. And Laurent decided at that point to kind of go off on his own. And Laurent disappeared for about a year. And uh, you didn't hear much out of him. The Mac Ruby project was kind of uh, moving slow at that time. And what he was doing is during that year that he took off from Apple, he was developing Ruby Motion. He wrote a compiler that takes essentially Mac Ruby and compiles it down to the bytecodes that I mentioned earlier. So he spent a year doing this. Uh, around April of last year, uh, right around RailsConf, just a little bit after RailsConf, he announced Ruby Motion as a commercial product. So it's been out there about a year. And, and, I th and so he's, 
So he's making money off of Ruby Motion. It's his commercial product. I think there's just a handful of other people in the company with him. So it's a very small company, but they're very dedicated to making this product real and, and usable. And uh, I must, must say the user group for it is very, very vibrant. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of traffic on the mailing lists for the Ruby Motion product. It's, it's getting a lot of attention. Okay, so. Um, Ruby is an object-oriented language. It maps very well to Objective-C, except for some really odd syntactic choices. Objective-C syntactically <coughs> looks a lot like Smalltalk. That actually works well for Ruby, at least from a conceptual level, because the Ruby object model is nearly identical to the Smalltalk object model. So at a semantic level, there's not a big deal of difference between the two. However, at a syntactic level, they are entirely different. So what you have to do is you have to learn how to write Objective-C code, because you know, all the docs coming from Apple are going to be talking about Objective-C. You're going to have to be able to look at that and say, oh, this is how I would translate that to Ruby. And here are your, th your three examples on how to do that. If, for methods of no arguments. In Objective-C, if you had a dictionary, for example, you could send it a count message and you get the size of the dictionary back. Ruby has the more traditional dot notation for objects, so you'd say dictionary.count, and that would be a direct translation for that. If your method has a single argument in Objective-C, you add a colon to it, object for key, and then you put, oops. <laughs> Try that again. You add a colon here, you pass the value for this keyword, and the method name in Objective-C is actually object for key, and the colon is part of the name, and it's recognized that as part of the name. That's how you know it takes an argument. In Ruby, you just say object for key, and you pass in a normal argument. So, so far, this version and this version, straight Ruby, no difference whatsoever. Now, the difference comes is when you have more than one argument in your method selector. Here we have set object colon for key colon. It's two arguments. And to do this, same call in Ruby, the first selector is the method name. You pass in object here as the first argument, comma. Then you use a kind of a keyword style hash argument for key colon and key. What Ruby motion will do, now this is actually legal Ruby syntax. If you did this on a regular, um, standard version of Ruby, this would actually compile. And what happens is that Ruby would compile a hash with a single key called for key and a single value in that hash. And it would pass a hash in as a second argument for this, for this. Now, what Ruby Motion does, it says, oh, it's very well could be a method that has two arguments. So I'm going to check my Objective-C compile time, and you know, and I'm not really sure if it does it at compile time or runtime. That's a little vague in my mind. But it will check, and if a method of this two-word two style, two-keyword style exists on this particular object, then uh, Ruby Motion will go ahead and do a Objective-C style call. If it doesn't exist, it'll go ahead and do a Ruby style call where it passes a hash. So it automatically selects between the two. So calling Objective-C code, easy peasy. All you have to do is remember that for multiple arguments, you've got to use this kind of hash light syntax. And then in Ruby, set object for key becomes the method selector in, uh, in Objective-C slash small talk terminology. OK. One other slight difference, and this is added more by, I think, the Ruby motion libraries than the language itself. If you have a set method on an object, Ruby will translate that, or the libraries will allow you to use the more idiomatic um, assignment on an attribute style of Ruby. So this takes uh, a color, white color and assigns it to the background attribute of this particular object. It actually calls a uh, background color equals method that gets <coughs> translated under the hood to a set background color selector method at the Objective-C level. So this is more idiomatic Ruby code, and you'll see this in regular Ruby code all the time. And uh, for Objective-C objects, at least, uh, they rewrite this and just have it forward delegate to this one. All right. Now, the other thing is, how do we write methods in Ruby that take these selector arguments? And this is where Ruby motion differs from standard Ruby. 
For no argument methods, no difference. Declare them like regular Ruby. For single argument methods, no difference. Declare them like that. But for um, objects or for methods that take multiple arguments, you put the keyword in here, and this will generate a Objective C style method for that particular Ruby class. That allows you to define methods that Objective C can call with multiple arguments. Now, if you are following Ruby at all, you will be aware that Ruby 2 has also introduced keyword arguments. They are entirely 100% not compatible with the Ruby motion version. So I don't know what Laurent is going to do uh, when Ruby 2 comes around. He might have to, they look the same, but semantically they're quite different. In uh, Ruby motion, this is the um, argument name, and this is the keyword that identifies the argument. In Ruby 2 standard now that they allow this, this is the argument name, and this is the initial value if you leave it off. So different semantics. I don't know what he's going to do. That will be interesting. Um, oh, I did want to point out, I was going to make a slide and I forgot. There are certain things you cannot do in Ruby Motion that if you are a Ruby programmer, you might expect to do. If you are not a Ruby programmer, you probably won't even miss them because you don't know they're there. But uh, for example, in Ruby, we can avow strings at any time we want to and provide program snippets as strings, avow them, and execute them. Cannot do that in Ruby Motion. Um, more somewhat of a technical issue, also somewhat of a license issue. The Apple folks don't like you evaluating arbitrary code on their little devices. So a little bit of both there. You can also not use the require statement. Yeah, what? You know, that, for those of you who do Ruby, we use require all the time. Require says bring in this library and make it available for my code to use. Well, what require does, it loads a file and evaluates it. <laughs> Can't do that in Ruby Motion, so there are no require statements in Ruby motion. What you do is you require them at compile time in the rake file, and we'll show you a little bit of that maybe. And uh, then when you compile, the library is all built in and linked together at that point in time. So you don't require them at runtime like you do in regular Ruby. Uh, there's a couple other differences, but those are the big two, uh, and they all uh, revolve around a val in some way, shape, or form. All righty. Um, questions at this time? Apple doesn't know. <laughs> so he, there are no way they can, they can know it? I, I, I can't say there's no way they can know it, but the, the binary code produced by RubyMotion is so close to the Objective-C, unless you like took an analyzer to it and said, oh, look, this is something that RubyMotion does. I recognize this. Unless you did something like that, you could not tell the difference. There's no obvious uh, difference between a RubyMotion app submitted to the App Store and an Objective-C app. And there are a number of Ruby Motion apps in the store right now. Uh, we don't know how many, mainly because companies are not advertising that they're using Ruby Motion, mainly because they're more concerned about consumers buying their product because it's a good product rather than buying because, oh, we use this co cool toolkit to uh, build it. I mean, consumers don't care if the app was built in Ruby Motion or not. But, um, I do know there is, I have a couple on my iPhone here. Uh, one is a adjunct program to Evernote. It does, uh, it takes uh, pastings and puts them into Evernote. And it's actually a Ruby Motion app that does that. Um, there's a game, it's a kind of a dumb game, but it's a game that's written in Ruby Motion that I have. And there's a number of other ones, but like I say, no one really knows how many are really out there. People are kind of keeping it on the down low. Uh, when they put the Ruby Motion apps out there, I, and I find that really interesting. So, is there is there ever going to be the possibility? Of, I guess this is my question. Is, but, um, I mean, is Apple ever going to be getting really mad about this and figure out some way to know if it's Ruby Motion? I there's no. You're right. There's no way to answer that in the absolute. Um, Laurent, being an ex-employee, kind of knows the ropes somewhat, a little bit. Okay. And so I'm sure that he's looked into that. 
Um, I don't think Apple really cares. As long as the apps are good and high quality, they're more concerned about that than what particular libraries or uh, if you used command line tools or if the source code was ultimately in Ruby rather than Objective-C. I'm not sure they care that much about it. Still goes through the submittal process. You don't get away from that at all. It is, it is in every sense a real iOS application. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, what they're really concerned with is that flash stuff. Can't let Adobe get their fingers into their product. Um, other than that, I don't think they really care all that much. Whether that will change in the future, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so what I intend to do right now is to actually build a Ruby Motion app from scratch. We'll do a Hello World, a really simple one. We'll play around with it, uh, have some fun with it. I've got a more advanced um, app that I'll show you. And just to kind of set your level of expectation, like I said, I'm not an iOS programmer. I don't do this professionally. I've been playing around with this library a lot. I am learning uh, iOS as I'm doing this. And what I'm doing um, for my learning project is to work through the Big Nerd Ranch book on iOS programming, which I have had multiple people tell me that's an excellent source to learn iOS programming from. So I see several people nodding their heads. Good, good. Validates me. Thanks. Um, and so what I do is I open that book and I read through their example, their expl explanation. I look at their Objective-C code and I just write Ruby code instead. And it's, it's kind of fun, especially at the beginning few chapters where they had you kick off a project from scratch up for every chapter. I was going through this and I said, okay, this is what you're going to do. I said, okay, I got it. He says, okay, now write your header. I said, oh, I don't have to write a header. <laughs> Skip that. <laughs> now decide what instance variables you're going to have. Oh, I don't have to do that yet. <laughs> Skip that. Now decide how you're going to allocate your variable. Oh, I don't need that. So about five pages into the chapter, <laughs> we get to meet a code that actually does something. And that's when I start paying attention to the code. So that's been my experience so far in working from an iOS, uh, from an Objective-C example, uh, doing it in, in pure Ruby. And so far, I've not found anything I can't do uh, with the Ruby stuff. OK, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and let's do some demos. So here I am. I'm in a demo directory right here. I've got a support directory and another directory. We're going to ignore that. The command we use, if you download and install Ruby Motion, you get a motion command. <laughs> Excuse me. That looks like this. And it comes with several um, support commands, subcommands in it. Uh, you say motion update, and if you do this, it will go out on the internet. It'll go to the Ruby Motion site. It will download the latest version of Ruby Motion and pick that up and install it. I'm not going to do that now because I validated all my things work with the current version I have. So we're not going to do a dynamic update. But that's how you update the product. And about once a week, it'll go out, and every time when you run motion, it'll check to see what version's out there. and says, oh, there's an update available. You might want to update sometime. So it lets you choose when to update. Uh, let's see. So there's other commands here. We are going to use motion create to create a project. I'm going to call my project hello. Okay, so it goes through, and if you've done any Rails development, this looks really familiar to Rails. It went through, created a hello directory, created a bunch of uh, directories and files in there. Not that many, though. So let's just cd in hello and see what we got. Let's open up this directory here. And we see we've got an app directory. In the app directory, there's one app delegate.h file. Uh, there is a rake file. Rake file is Ruby's version of make. And we use a rake file to build everything. So you'll see the rake command run a lot. I might know something about rake. <laughs> really? Maybe. There's a reason. <laughs> I wrote rake in case anybody doesn't get that joke. OK. I feel really funny claiming that up front. Oh, I wrote rake. <laughs> big deal. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> What's rake? Yeah, so big deal. 
Uh, you get a resources directory. This is where you'll pop in your images and your other resources that uh, will be used during your app for your application. And you get a spec directory. So tests are supported right out of the box. Woohoo! We'll see some more of that later. Um, so let's look at the app delegate, and that's the main entry point for all your Ruby Motion code. So I'm going to open up app, app delegate, and it looks like this. Let's um, make it a little smaller there. Yeah, okay, yeah, it fits along. Can everyone see that okay? Maybe, why don't you turn off the lights right back there in the front so we can see the screen just. Our video kind of likes light. Oh, it likes light, okay. I can actually read it fine. Okay, well, if you guys can read it, we'll just leave it like that. I've discovered that Objective-C code and Ruby written in Objective-C style tends to have really long lines. So big monitors are a good thing. But uh, I like to have my editor here and then my simulator on the side here. And it's just the perfect size for that. So we'll just do that. So I just ran, um, so this is the, the thing. It does absolutely nothing. It just, so it has an application method. Wrong. It's not an application method. It's an application did finish launching with options method because it has a keyword argument. So this is our very first Objective-C method written in Ruby. So right away, this is the first method that's called when your program starts. And it just returns true. So there's nothing else. There's nothing else in the app directory at all, except for this one file with five lines in it. I'm going to run the rate command. The rate command is the one that builds the program and launches it. So build, compile, link, create, and bam, the program is running. You don't see anything here because the application does absolutely nothing. And that's what it's doing right now, absolutely nothing. But the program is actually running. That's cool. And then over here, you actually have an interactive window where you can type in Ruby code. 3 plus 5. And it evaluates and tells you the answer is 8. So you can actually run Ruby code over here, and we'll see a little bit more of that in a second. So let's get out of that. Killed the program. Let's actually do something interesting in this program. I'm going to create an alert um, message, UI alert view dot new. Um, you can say alloc init, and that's the more idiomatic objective C way to say it. Uh, in a lot of cases, you can get by with saying new as well. That's the more idiomatic Ruby way of saying it. So I'm, I haven't decided yet whether my Ruby motion code should look more like objective C or look more like Ruby. And since I'm still learning, I, have, I, I, I go back and forth. So, that, and that's, that's still a big debate out there. I think, most, I think if you're a Rubyist, you'll probably write your code to look like Ruby code. And if you're coming from the Objective-C side of the house, you'll probably make it look like what you're used to seeing in Objective-C. I don't see any problem with that. Except maybe I should spell message with just two S's. So, I create an alert object. I'm using the UI alert view. This is a standard iOS um, class that we're invoking. We're creating a new object. I'm setting the message field on the alert. And then I'm asking the alert to show itself. And let's run rake and see what we get. Build, compile, link, and woohoo! There we go. Awesome. Now I have no buttons here to click. Huh, I wonder how I get buttons on that. Anybody know? Well, let's ask Motion. Motion, RI is Ruby documentation. And let's ask it about the UI alert view. Oh, yeah, it's complaining. I'm in Emacs, not in a regular terminal. OK, sure. And it says uh, the UI alert for class is used to display an alert message to the user. The alert view function is similar, but differs to appearance from an action sheet, blah, blah, blah. I don't even know what an action sheet is. OK. Uh, but here's some instance methods. And look, here's an instance method says add button with title. Oh, that might be interesting. Let's go back to our code and say alert add button with title. Uh, okay. Let's, oops, get out of the help. There. <laughs> I'll try rake again. And this time I get a program with an alert box and Da, 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 an OK button that I can click and it goes away. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm writing Ruby code. It's running on, 
It's, it's running on the simulator. <laughs> That's exciting. I, I, I saw this and I, and I um, oh, you know, I, I got really excited about this because truthfully guys, I love Ruby. I've been doing Ruby for 13 years and Objective-C is okay. Um, but the, as a language, it's never really excited me. And that might be blasphemous here in this user group, but you know, we can, you know, this is how I feel. And, but R Ruby, Ruby is a cool language. And to see it running on an iOS device is like empowering feel to me. I'm really, really excited about this. So let's see what else we can do. Uh, okay, exit out of the program. Let's go back up here. Let's get rid of this alert nonsense. Let's write a real program with some real windows. And uh, to cut down on typing, I have an editor macro here that's going to help me a little bit. I'm going to write a hello view controller. So this will be a real application with a real view and a real controller in it. And these three lines is what I need. I create, I'll say in my application when it launches, I create a UI window. I allocate, alloc it, I init it with this frame and the frame I'm using is the full, sc full screen of the main screen. I set its root controller to be a hello view controller, which I have not yet created. We'll do that next. And then I say, make that window key invisible. And that's just, I, you guys know all this. I don't know why I'm explaining it. It, it just makes that window the, the thing that receives button presses and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, see, when, when you get down to the specific alloc and init with something, I tend to stay with that idiom because I know it works. <sighs> um, ask that question again after I run the demo, and we'll give it a try and see. Oh, does it? Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Okay, cool, cool. Okay. So this would work. Let's let's try it. Cool. Actually, this will fail because I haven't defined my controller yet. Okay, there you see there you see an example of it failing, and uh, we'll come back here and we see uh, uninitialized constant in app delegate called hello view controller. Okay, let's go ahead and create that. In my app directory, I'm going to create a hello view controller.rb file. It's a class. Hello view controller. This is how you create a class in Ruby. No, ex no uh, difference there. It's going to inherit from uh, UI view controller. And there's a class. And the method I need to really worry about is uh, view did load. And when we load, we, um, this, this is the message, this is a lifecycle message that gets sent to the controller when the view is ready to go. And then you can do stuff, you can manipulate the view and do stuff after it's loaded. So I'm going to tell the view to uh, set its background color to the UI color of the red color. This is so Objective-C like. You say color, 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 three times in that one line. I think I'm dealing with a color. Close the bracket. Which bracket? The UI view controller. Oh, up here? Uh, this means inherits from. Oh, so, so hello view controller inherits from a UI view controller. So it gets all the methods that iOS expects. So yeah, that's just Ruby's way of saying that. Good question. Yeah, and if you guys have Ruby questions, feel free to just call them out as I'm going through this. Woo! <laughs> it's red. Surprise. <laughs> cool. Let's put some interesting stuff on there, OK? Ah, yes. In fact, let's create some instance variables. Uh, I don't want to keep that red. That's a little eye jarring. So let's make it a white background there. And uh, Ruby Motion label editor macro. Boom. Uh, 
Hello and hello, comma, world. So this is going to, uh, I'll walk through all this stuff. This is just so I, you don't have to bear with me doing all this typing. Um, so, at hello creates an instance variable called hello for this object and assigns it to be a UI label object, which we alloc in a knit with frame, and here's the frame right there. I'm going to be uh, 10 in from the x direction. It's going to be y down from the top, and I, I need to set y. We're going to use y later here. Let's just set y to 10 there. And then the size is going to be the view frame size width minus 20, so that gives us 10 pixels margin on either side, and it's going to be 30 high. It's going to use a 20 system font there. The text is going to be hello world. It's going to be dark gray. The background is going to be clear. I add it to the view, so, it's a, so this label is a subview. And if you're familiar with the way any UI is built, it's a, it's a hierarchy of, of views containing other views. So I'm just saying what this particular, uh, this view for the view controller contains. And then I increment Y, and we'll, again, we'll use that a little bit later. Let's go ahead and run this. Exit rake. And uh, what did I? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went up there and showed you that. And I fat fingered it. Thank you. There we go. Hello world label at the top, 10 pixels down, 10 pixels in. Awesome. Now, let's show you this. I'm going to take my mouse, I'm going to hover over this, and I'm going to press the command button. You see, can you see that there, that the outer box is outlined in red? I'm going to hover over the label. There, now the label's red, now the outer box is red, now the label's red, now the outer box is red. Look what happens down here when I do that. UI view, UI label, UI view, UI label. I'm going to click on the label. And what I did is in the evaluator here, I just set that UI element to be self for the purposes of this interpreter. So if I say self, it says self is the UI label. Cool. Well, let's ask questions about this UI label. Self dot text. Oh, it's hello world. Uh, let's change it. Hi there. Boom, thank you, yes, boom. <laughs> Forgot, this is, a, this is an Apple demonstration, boom. <laughs> I can change the text. I can say self.background color is UI color dot green color. And it changes dynamically. Oh, I wonder what the view hierarchy is here. So I got the label right there, self. What is its super view? Oh, the super view is a UI view. Well, what's its super view? Well, that's the UI window. That's the outermost top level root view. If I go one more, I should get nil. Cool. Let's go back here. Uh, so this is the, uh, the UI view. Oops, no dot at the end. There we go. So I saved UI view in a variable called UIV. I can now talk about UIV and say, uh, what are its subviews? And it has a label as a subview. Cool, so I can walk this. I can um, see UI view delegate. It's in the super view. I never remember where these things are. Ah, so there is the controller. And I can ask the controller to get, um, let's see, it's instance variable get. Did I spell that right? And I called it hello. I'm going off script here, guys. Uh, hello, is it at hello? Ah, yeah, so I can dig into the controller. I can ask it for its instance variables. I can reflect on that. I can send it messages. Uh, right now, there's not a whole lot of messages on my controller that make it interesting, but there could be. That's a cool thing. Let's, uh, let's do a little more. So I'm not done here yet. Let's, uh, let's do something else. Let's, uh, let's add a button. And again, I use a nice editor macro here. 
The button is going to go in a variable called push me. It is a button with type UI button type rounded rec. It has this frame here, and I'm using the Y, and I'm incrementing Y as I add things to the view so they just keep piling on top of each other. Uh, we're going to set the title to push me, and the action is going to be push. So here, I'm saying on this push me button, I'm going to add a target that is self, that will be the controller. So when the button is pushed, it will send a message to the controller. The action it's going to send is the message pushed. And it's for control events colon UI control event touch up inside. It's objective C, okay. And I keep forgetting this when I practice this. I'm going to define pushed because if I don't, when I push that button, it's going to die. And let's just put a little message here that says pushed, exclamation point, rake. There's push me. Oh, look. Every time I push the button, I get a little push message coming out. So it's, it's interacting with me. You see the button is here. It's a standard UI button. It's reacting that way. I can command click on it and now self is a UI group table view cell background Eh, I don't know what that is how about this it's super view oh there's the rounded rectangle button so I can get to that button is here okay cool uh, the button uh, let's see let's go let's uh, let's go to the button super view and ask for its sub views and there we see the, sub, the, the UI view has two uh, labels on there, two subviews, the label and the round button. So again, we can explore and do things. Uh, we can do fun things like button dot, let's see, let's grab the frame. Button dot frame is there. And let's set button dot frame dot, um, Let's see, and this new frame F, I'm going to say it's origin.y is at 100. And I'm going to say button.frame equals that F variable I just modified. And I just moved my push button down the screen. Oh, cool. We can play games with that. Are you running the 6.1 six, six, uh, simulator, I think. Yes. D uh, what difference does that make? Oh, did they? Okay, okay. All right, so cool. We can do that. Um, uh, let's go ahead and add another button. I like buttons. Uh, let's see here. Oh, let's, no, let's do some more here. And uh, let's, instead of just doing push, let's, uh, let's have it have a counter. And I'm going to lazy initialize the counter to zero. So if the counter has never been set, this is a Ruby idiom that sets it to zero. Otherwise, it leaves it alone. Then I'm going to say counter plus equals one. That increments the counter. So the first time through, first time we push it, it'll increment it to one. And then I'm going to take the hello label and change its text to read hello comma world. And then in parentheses, I'm going to interpolate the counter. We can get rid of that pushed message because now we should see things happen on screen. Exit rake. And when I say push me, it should count. Hoo hoo! Very nice. Now there's no sense in counting if we can't clear it too. So let's go ahead and add another button called clear that has the clear title and it will call clear counter. I have to come down here and I have to actually write a method called clear counter. And you notice I just automatically go to underscores. That's Ruby idiomatic for method names. Uh, Objective C would be to use camel case there. Which do you use? I don't know. I, uh, when I'm writing Ruby code, I'll probably just use underscores. Um, but, I, but there's there's questions on that. And uh, okay, style just style questions. Uh, let's set the counter. 
to zero. And let's take the hello text and set it back to just hello world with no counter in it. Exit rake. Ah, now I got a push me button. Push, 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 push. And a clear button that clears it. Push some more. Clear, and yeah, so we got, we got functioning buttons. You can build up your UI like this quite easily. Now you're saying, oh, Jim, but Jim, you're using editor macros to do all that typing, and there's a lot of work. Where's our thing? There it goes. That's a lot of work to get buttons in there programmatically, and you're right, it is a lot of work. But um, a lot of this, you know, if you look at this and compare it to the section right underneath it, it varies in three ways. The name of the instance variable I'm setting here, the um, title that I'm setting here, and the action that I'm choosing to set here. I could refactor this out into a method and say at push me uh, equals make button with the title push me that calls pushed. And then um, I can add it to the view, sub view, and then I can increment y just like that. So I can get it down to three lines pretty easily just by refactoring that section out into a, a method. Um, rather than working through this and watching me refactor all this by hand, I actually wrote a little, little tiny one file library. Let's see if I can find it. It's in support, and it's called layout. And we're going to copy layout into our app directory. And so let's just look at layout real quick. So here's layout. It has a make label function that does exactly the same things we were doing with label. Uh, and it passes in text. Here's that make button I mentioned that I could have written. And here is the code for it. And then it has something called a layout builder. And down here it has a layout method that takes a view, it takes an x margin and a y margin, creates a layout builder with the view, x margin, and y margin, and then yields to the layout builder like that. Now, if you've never seen yield before, yield is Ruby's way of calling an anonymous function. Let me just jump down here. I'm going to type in this file just so you can see, okay? So if I have a method called layout and I pass it in 10, 10, oops, the first thing will be the view, view comma 10, 10, do layout end with code goes here. What happens is this layout method is called here. We create a layout builder. We then yield, when we yield, we go back to this do end block right here, and we execute the do end block wherever that yield is shown. And we pass into the do end block a variable called layout. Actually, let's call it LO because the method is called layout. I don't want confusion there. So LO, and then I can do things with LO down here. And I can call methods on it and do whatever I want to with it. So then when we reach the end, we go back to where the yield was called and just continue from there. So the yield is calling that do end block as a subroutine. That's all it's doing. It's a subroutine call. We just don't bother to name the do end block with a name. It's an anonymous function. Kind of functional. Um, you got blocks in Objective C, right? Same idea. They're just way, way, way more pervasive in Ruby. So let's get rid of that. So I got the layout thing here. Now let's go back to our Hello View controller and fix this up. So I don't need that Y anymore because our layout manager is going to do that. I'm going to call layout with the view. And I'm going to give it 10 and 10 as the margins that I want to have it respect. I'm going to have a do end block here. I'm going to pass it the layout builder. Let's just call it LB for layout builder. How about that? Ooh, and that quote doesn't need to be there. Okay, now in here, I want to create the hello button, make uh, hello label that says hello, comma, world. 
I want to create the push me button, make button, and that is push me, and that calls pushed. And I want to create the clear counter button, make button, that says clear, and it calls clear counter. Let's call the button just clear then. So the method is called clear counter, and the button is called clear. And then I'm going to take the layout builder, and I'm just going to insert these things into the layout builder. Hello, we're going to insert the uh, push me, push me, and we'll insert the clear. And all this other junk goes away. So now I got my user interface down to about four lines of code, plus the layout stuff. Okay, and, and you know, this layout manager is not real smart. It just stacks things up in order like we were doing, but that's all it does. But it's a nice interface to do this. So let's, uh, let's rake this up and see if I have any errors in this. You see here, uh, we're compiling the, oops, I missed something. Let me back up here. I was pointing out that I did right here on this line. So we did compile the layout manager in there. What's my error? Undefined method layout for hello controller line six. Oh, oh, you know what? I have to say include layout. So layout is a module. When you include a module into a Ruby class, it mixes all those methods in. So I'll get the make button, the make label, and the layout method now. So that should know about that. Notice we didn't compile the layout this time. We just compiled the Hello View controller because that's all we needed to build. Rake is smart about only rebuilding parts of the app that you need. So if you got a large app, you change one file, it'll only recompile that one file for you. Ah, look, look what we got. We got Hello World and Push Me and Clear, and it's all working like it did before. So even though we're not using Interface Builder to build up these user interfaces, by the, the reason that, by the fact that we're using layout managers and smart libraries and, and DSLs, domain-specific languages, to kind of control this stuff, uh, it actually is not that big a pain to do everything from just a simple editor without worrying about Interface Builder. I don't have to worry about, um, what are they called, outlets? Inlets or outlets? Or I forget. I don't even remember what they're called because I skipped those pages <laughs> in the iOS book. Um, yes. Yes. If you like Interface Builder and you want to go that route, Ruby Motion will not stop you from doing that. You can go ahead and do it. There's a gem, and it works and it works fine. My my goal has kind of been not to go that route. Kind of explore this area of it because it's it's a learning experience for me. Uh, basically define outlets in your Ruby Motion class of mm -hmm. and interface builder. He wrote some maybe it's a break patch or something like that to define those and then let uh as code that about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like you do in your Objective C in your header, you use these outlet, inlet and outlet or type declarations that's found by some tool that scans that and, and compile and ties that into interface builder. They're just doing the same thing with the Ruby code. Uh, terminology gem is a Ruby term for a distributable library. So when we say there's a gem for that, that means, hey, someone has written a library and it's doggone easy to install. Uh, just you say gem install in the library name and you've got it on your system. So Ruby libraries are trivial to install and it's true for Ruby motion libraries as well. They are also distributed by gems and you can install them and uh, they will be special Ruby motion gems designed to be used with Ruby motion. Uh, so you're not going to be able to take a Ruby, a standard Ruby gem and use it because it'll have things like require in it. But you, there are Ruby motion gems that can be downloaded in the same way and installed. And we'll, we'll look at a few of those too. Yes.
So I wrote this really cool diagram, and you guys probably all know this stuff already, but it really helped me kind of understand what's going on. So here's that app delegate, that first thing that gets entered uh, when your program launches. It creates a UI window, um, it, and then attaches a controller, a root controller to that window. We wrote a hello view controller. That view controller gets a view did load message sent to it. It then starts building up the UI views and adds the labels and the buttons at that point and ties the whole thing together. So from the controller, the view will be this thing. The view is delegates to the hello controller. So it's, so it's kind of like views and controllers if you use to MVC type terminology. So whenever an event happens in a view, the view informs its delegate, which is the controller, hey, uh, a button was pressed, or um, the view is loaded, or the view is about to disappear, do what you need to do right before I disappear, and the controller handles all that logic. The view is just the, just interacts with the screen, it has no really smart logic in it. The controller is where you put your smart logic in it, and it delegates that to there. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how that's all wired together. Now this is the app I'm going to show you next. This is, uh, so, like I say, I'm up to chapter 12. I'm ready to start chapter 12 in the, in the iOS, iOS Big Nerd Ranch book. So this is the app, simplified version of the app, uh, at the end of chapter 11. The only thing I didn't include here, you will have a, um, uh, a nav controller that allows you to stack views. I didn't include that in the, this diagram here, uh, but the app actually has it in it. It's a little more complicated in that we've added models now. And this app is a list. Let's go ahead and run it so you can see what it looks like. Escape out of that first. That tends to work better. Uh, let's see here. Exit. Let's see. Nerd work. It's called the Home Poner application because you list stuff in your application, uh, in your home that you own, and you put it in this list that you manage on your iPhone. Let's go ahead and rake that up. And here it is. Um, it starts out, the list starts out empty, but when I hit the plus button, it adds random uh, objects to my list of things that I own. You can edit these things here grab them and move them around the list. Uh, you can delete things if you want to. There it goes. Hit done. I can click on that and instead of shiny mate, uh, mate I can talk about delicious mate. You guys ever drink mate? It's a South American tea that you put a bunch of leaves in your cup and then you drink it out of a filtered metal straw. I've been, I uh, learned to drink that just recently. So there, there's that. That's the application right there. Uh, let's look at the diagram for that. So again, here's the diagram. There is a item store that stores your items. It's essentially a list, but it knows how to interact with the iOS system. It has some special message on it. It's essentially, it's just a list of items that is here and it manages this list. When I send it a, when I click on a delete button, uh, the delete button message gets down to the items controller eventually and it tells the list to find the tenth item in the list and remove it. It does that and then the items controller informs the view that it's, that those changes have been made. Um, so table view is the thing that lists all the things up in a row. Uh, each table view has a table cell um, there, and the table cells map not one-to-one, -one, but almost one-to-one -one with items in here. I'll tell you why, why it's not exactly one-to-one -one in a second. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and talk about that. So, you might have a hundred items in your list, and items are cheap. They're just Ruby objects. No big deal having a hundred of those. But cell objects, UI table view cells, are expensive view objects. They are difficult to create, they take up a lot of memory. So you don't want to have a lot of these. You only want one of these for every item you see in the actual view. Things that are below or above the current window of that list, you don't need a cell item for that. So what iOS does, or what you have to do in your code that manages this list, is that when 
is time when that list scrolls and one item scrolls off the list and a new item scrolls on, you have to make a decision. You first ask the view, uh, do you have any unused cells laying around? It will grab, if it does, it will grab that cell, add it to the list, it will tie it to one of a real item so the data gets displayed, and then the thing that scrolls off will be returned to the list of unused cells. If there are no unused cells, if this is empty, then we go ahead and create a new cell and add it to the list. So we only have enough cells to display what's actually there. I understand this wasn't done in the very first versions of iOS and they had some really big performance problems with list views, but this cleared a lot of those problems up. So let's, uh, you saw the code work here. Let's go take a brief view, a brief look at the code to see what it's doing. So, home pwner, it's a regular directory just like before. Uh, the app directory has a couple things in it. It has the app delegate file. It has the item store and item objects. And it has a item view controller. It also has the detailed view controller. If you go in here, if you click on one of these things, you'll go into a detailed view where you can edit it. Um, so that's what I don't want to look at that right now. Let's just concentrate on the item view controller. So we'll start off. Let's look at the model object first, item, because it's the simplest. Open up app item. That's all it is. You initialize it with a name, a value, and dollars, and a serial number. We store those in instance variables. We have a 2S that converts that to a string. This is what you see in the list item when it gets displayed. Uh, we have a class method called random item that will select random words and random serial numbers out of that and construct a brand new random item for us. That's what, so when you hit the plus button, it fills it up with data. This wouldn't be in a real app, but it's nice for this demo app. <laughs> That's it. That's just a plain old Ruby object. There's nothing iOS-y about this at all. Let's look at item store, the thing that holds it. Item store. The first thing you notice about item store is that it is a uh, singleton of sorts. There is a shared store item that is a class method that returns, well, it will initialize the class variable shared store the first time it's called with a uh, item store object and then thereafter just return that shared store over and over and over again. So you only ever create one of these things and you always access it through the shared store method. Um, initialize just creates an array that's empty. Create item takes a random item, puts it on that array. Uh, there's a size of method that just delegates to the underlying array. There's a index operator. So if I say array store square brackets and pass in an argument, then it will call items. The argument that's passed in is an index pass. And that's because things in a table list can be in sections and you have section numbers and row numbers in that. I just care, I only got one section, so I only care about the row number. So all I do is pull out the row number and pass it down directly to the array. I have a shovel operator that shovels things onto the item store and it just delegates to the array itself. So, like I say, just some really basic methods. Remove item will delete an item and it does it by identity. It uses the dot equal question mark. So um, I use object identity to detect when it's deleted. Move will delete an item at the from location and reinsert it into the to location. This is when you do the drop and drag. This method will be called. And index will take an item and find it within the list. And then each is just Ruby's way of making this in a standard iterable collection. So I can do all those standard Ruby iteration methods on it as well. Uh, let's look at the, the app delegate. Um, yeah, nothing really exciting there, I guess. A little more work than we did on the other one, but that's because we got some more complicated objects we're creating. Let's go ahead and look at the item view controller. So this is the item view controller. It, it inherits from a UI table view controller. So it's a little more complicated than our last controller. It knows about table views. Uh, 
We have some init stuff here. This builds up the title bar that you see. So navigation item title, that's that sets the home pointer right here. It sets up a right button, which is the plus sign here. It sets up the left bar button as an edit button item right there. And somehow magically that just works. I don't know why, but the book told me to do it that way. Uh, then I have load view and I just, you know what, I'm not even sure what this line does and it looks funky because I'm using hard coded coordinates there. In fact, that used to be a 480, and I kept playing with it, changing to see what it does. It doesn't seem to do anything. So I'll have to check the book to see why that line's there. Um, then down here, these are the actions. When the button is hit, add new item. And it takes a sender. This is the button that was pressed. So when we add a new item, I go to the item store, grab the shared store, create an item. I take the shared store and find the position of that item in the store. And then I create a index path for that row, for that item. And I say table view. So this, says, this is a message to the view. So my controller is telling the view that I just inserted an item at this path and to animate the insertion of that item. So things will drop down and shift around. And you get some nice animation there. The edit button, we'll call this one, and we just ask, are we currently editing? And if we are editing, then I want to set the, t the button name to edit, and uh, then set editing to false. Otherwise, I set the button to done and set editing to true. So you can see that when I click edit, it'll say done. When I click done, it goes back to edit. So that's just that behavior right there. Just real simple uh, if then else. After this, we get the table view protocol. There's lots of things. Since this is a table view controller, the table view will send messages to our controller all the time, asking it to do particular things. This one, table view number of rows in section. It wants to know how many rows are in that particular section of the table view so it can allocate the right number of cells and, and whatnot for that. And we just need to tell it the size of our index store, item store. Table view cell for row at index path. So this is saying, oh, I need to display this item at this position in the store. I need a display cell to do that. Please give me one. So what we need to do is we need to decide, are we going to reuse a cell or are we going to create a new cell? And this is just a Ruby idiom that says, uh, calls all the stuff that you need to do the reuse with from the table view. And if that returns a nil, if it doesn't find a reusable cell, it'll go ahead and create a new cell. We can skip down and look at those. Reuse cell just calls deck reusable cell with identifier. And new cell just creates a new cell in the UI table view cell with that particular style. Um, this is that part of the protocol I described where you only have enough cells to display what's going on the screen at any given time. So this is how you would do it in, in Ruby. And I really like this because this is a one-liner here that re it tells me exactly what I'm doing. I either reuse a cell or I use a new, or I use a new cell. And as a one-liner, I can directly read my intention there. If you look at the standard iOS code for doing this, it's like five or six lines uh, just to get that done. Um, and of course, I've refactored those into helper methods, so that's part of that. But that's, that's, that's pretty standard, standard Ruby type stuff to do. Okay, so uh, I got a cell. I grabbed the item from the, uh, from the store. I initialized the cell with the data from the item, and then I return the cell, and then the table view will display my cell. And that's how the data gets on the screen. Uh, this is editing stuff. So when you go and delete an item, you get this message sent to you. Uh, here is the move message that gets sent to the controller when the view detects that a item has been moved from one position to another. You have to update your store so that uh, it reflects the proper order of items. And uh, let's see, the only other thing I didn't cover is up here at the top. It says view will appear. This is a message that gets sent when the view is not currently being displayed and it's about, being dis about to be displayed. So that happens when you click one of these now the view is off screen, and I change this 
to, uh, from rusty tea to uh, green tea, I hit this button to go back, the view, the list view will redisplay. But it needs to know that the data has changed underneath it. So when it goes back, it gets the message, the view will appear, and you call super, delegate upward the inheritance chain, and then you tell the table view to reload all its data because you possibly just edited it. So there you go. That's, that's basically the controller right there. Questions? Ruby Motion does not get you out of the need to learn the iOS infrastructure. If you are a Rubyist and you think, oh great, I can just write Ruby code and have it run on my iPhone. Nope, not going to happen. You're going to have to learn the iOS system calls. You're going to have to learn about life cycles of these tables and views and how they're all edited together. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good size learning curve. So expect that. You guys, of course, you already know that. So your challenge will be to learn Ruby and get used to that. Um, I think, I think it's well worth it. I've been real excited about writing code to do this. And then uh, uh, questions. I got one more thing to show you, and then we'll go back to slides. But I want to uh, questions before I move off this demo. Uh, before you say that word, I saw that the Ruby motion is for people knowing, knowing expert of Ruby. You know, they want to pick up all their data so they can pick up it very fast. But how you say that, maybe it's, so it's uh, in between. <laughs> You know, I, I am excited about the Ruby language. You can do things in the Ruby language that just is not, there's some, I want to be careful here because Objective-C is a fine language and I don't want to, you know, I want to say, I don't want to say Ruby is so much better than Objective-C. That's not my goal here. But, but I have found Ruby to be so expressive and you're able to write code that reads so well that the ability to do that in the iOS platform is exciting to me. And I think that may be enough for people who already know Objective-C that oh, maybe this Ruby thing would be interesting to have a look at. It's thoroughly object oriented. The object model is very similar to what you've already learned. It's just a really expressive syntax that you get along, that you get along with it. So that's kind of my take on that, if that helps. Yep. Yep. Uh, you still get method missing. Um, there are some of the really dynamic stuff I don't think you can do uh, in Ruby Motion. I don't remember the details. I know eval and um, require are not there. I at one time thought define method wasn't there, but I experimented this week and define method seems to be working. So that's kind of a dynamic piece of Ruby that you can use. Um, uh, in your code. It looks, experiments seem to show that you can. Okay. Um, so, when I, uh, oh, you know what? I haven't done. How are we doing on time? How late do you guys go here? Okay, you're good? Okay, I won't, I won't go past 8.30. Um, I just, this is, this, is the, this is the fun part of doing these demos. You, you do the, them live and you forget things. Um, let me go, let me go, before I show you this application, let me go back to the nerd one. Work, uh, home homer. And I wanted to show you the spec directory because I actually wrote some specs in there. Spec, item, store, spec. So you have a very simple RSpec-like testing language. If you've ever used RSpec to do testing, it's a very simple one. There are some differences. You say, um, you show, yeah. I don't see any examples here. You say, you use a lot more dots in this version of, of uh, RSpec-like thing than you do in the natural RSpec. It's actually an older syntax that RSpec used to support. And they went away with that. But I can describe, okay, so here's an item store. I create some items. I say the store should reflect its size. So it should just be four. If I grab all the items ID in the store, it should be one, two, three, four in that order. I can fetch its contents. So, you know, at path zero, it should be item one. At path one, it should be item two. I can 
ask for the index of particular items and get zero or three or an item that's not in the store should return nil. Uh, I can remove an item. So if I remove item three when I ask for the IDs, item three is no longer there. Uh, I can move item two to, to, uh, to one. Or here, item, actually, the comment is wrong. Zero to one and one to three. Okay. And you say rake spec compiles, runs. Do, 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 do. And there you go. 14 specification, 27 requirements, no failures, no errors. So you can unit test your code. Now I've not played deeply with this. I've only unit tested the really Ruby-ish, the model part of my application. You can do things in testing the views and the controllers a little bit. I've not explored that personally yet. That's one of the things I want to get into a little bit more. But uh, there's ways of doing that as well. So that's the testing framework. The other thing I wanted to show is actually getting this on a device. So I have an iPhone here. You have to uh, provision your iPhones. You have to have uh, uh, Apple developers, paid up developers license to do this. And yeah, I got the provisioning set up in this. So this is the home pwner. You say rake device. Plug it in. Hit return. Deploy and... Do, 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 do. Done. Um, home pwner. So there you can see I'm plus, pressing the plus button and getting things like uh, nasty bears and shiny teas and, and things filled out on my list here. So deployed on the device. It's that easy. No, you do not. I say that and I don't think you do. Um, the REPL is really interesting in how that works. Because what happens when you type, if you're in the REPL and you type 1 plus 2, the code actually takes that, compiles it down to LLVM bytecodes, sends the bytecodes over to the simulator, then runs it on the simulator. So that's actually how, so every, t every line you type in the REPL on your command line there, it actually compiles it down to bytecode, sends the bytecodes over to the simulator. I don't think, they don't do that on the phone, so uh, you, you don't have that ability. Okay, one last thing. This is, this is uh, uh, one, one last project, and I, I want to show you some libraries. Uh, So, this is the pair programming bot. Um, if you are ever in a situation that you wish you could pair program and no one will pair with you at that moment, you can load this on your iPhone and it will ask you questions. Like, do you have a test for that? And you can say, no, I do not. Well, then write a test. Done. Does the test pass? No, it does not. Well, then write enough code to make the test pass. Okay, we're done. Does the test pass now? Oh, yes, it does. Do you need to refactor? Yes. Oh, so refactor the code. I'm done. Do the test still pass? Yes. I no longer need to refactor. Choose a new feature to implement and go on. So this is, this is all you need for pair programming uh, by yourself. Um, this is not in the App Store yet. I plan to actually put it out on the App Store. I want to get through the, the big iOS book first, uh, and then I plan to put this out there. But uh, this, is, this is my fun fun little project. If you want to, if you actually want to use it and you don't have it on your iPhone yet, pairprogrammingbot.com will do the same thing for you. All right. Uh, actually, this is just static HTML pages. Oh, the, the, the pair programming bot? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a RubyMotion app. So, so um, I heard about RubyMotion at RailsConf last year. I said, this is awesome. I need a copy of this ASAP. 
And uh, Rich Kilmer, who knows Laurent, was the guy showing me that. And Rich says, I'll hook you up. So about three days before it became public, I got a copy of Ruby Motion. Um, but uh, so in preparation for that, I spent three days on, um, uh, with, a, with the prag pr Pragmatic Programmers iOS programming book. Spent three days doing Objective-C programming. I got the uh, Ruby Motion, uh, installed it, and in half a day I had that program up and running. So that program is a result of three days on Objective-C, half a day on Ruby Motion. So there you have it. Um, and if you go to the Ruby Motion website, I think it's still there. I. Uh, Oh, uh, somewhere there's a bunch of quotes. I don't see it now. Yeah, they, they, they quoted me on, on this the site. Since I got it early, they, he wanted a pull quote for his site, and I, he, he, uh, I gave him a pull quote for that. Oh, well, it's there somewhere. Well, you, I, wa I was, I was... <laughs> Actually, I gave him two quotes. He, he, I, I gave him a quote before I even saw it because I was excited about getting it. Then once I got it, I gave him a brand new quote. I said, this is even better than I thought. This is awesome. And then, uh, so I used it for a while. Then I got distracted by life's trials and tribulations, and I've been really busy and just recently got back into it. So I'm, my goal is to finish the uh, Big Nerd book and then continue on and maybe do some real, real uh, um, uh, iPhone apps. I got a couple ideas of some stuff I want to write. Um, and I think they'll be fun. In fact, uh, they, one of them is really, really, really close to that uh, list app that I was demoing here tonight. It wouldn't take much, a little domain change. It would be just about what I need for the one app I, idea I have in mind. So cool. All right, uh, we'll just finish up real quick here. So libraries, let's talk really briefly about libraries. There's lots of libraries. Um, if you go to rubymotionwrappers.com, there are almost 40 individual gems that they list here. They do all kinds of different things. Um, I have not used any of these yet. So just, just beware, because I'm, I'm still working through the book, I want to learn the basics first. And once I learn the basics, I'm going to go back and start using some of this stuff as well. But uh, uh, Bubble Wrap gives you really nice uh, shortcuts to a lot of things like persistence and timers that run after a half a second, things to do really simple, a very Ruby-like interface to a lot of these things. Uh, that's bubble wrap. Uh, Sugarcube also does a lot of Ruby shortcuts to things. If you want to construct a fancy text message with uh, italics and monospaces and things like this, this will go and do all that and then create a UI label of it and then shove it into a view. And that's kind of handy. Here is animation. So, uh, UI view animation chain, slide left, slide up, slide right, and then fade out. So you can chain animations in a very nice way. A lot of uh, UI button, button things there for shortcuts. This is a small, small sample of what is in Sugarcube. There's, uh, go look at the web page for all the stuff on there. A teacup is CSS styling for your views. It gives you a CSS style DSL, so you declare a style sheet, for the finish button, origin here, title here, and then you have a style sheet main layout that you use the finished button on that sub view there, and it will apply the style sheet there. So rather than programmatically doing all that styling, you can, you can do it with a CSS style, and some people really like that. Um, this is, oh, <laughs> I didn't put the title up there. This is motion layout. Another layout thing but it's a little fancier than the one I showed you, but I kind of stole some of the style from it, if you notice that here. Um, you, you get a do end block, and within the do end block, you get a layout. You say, okay, the view is this. The sub views, or you have a switch sub view and a help sub view. And then the vertical layout will be 15 pixels of padding. You'll have the switch, 10 pixels of padding. You'll have the help. That's the same size as switch. 
then another 15 padding at the bottom. In the horizontal view, you'll have the switch with 10 pixel padding on each side and the help with 10 pixel padding on each side. So you lay it out like this and everything. Have you used any of these, Peter? Uh huh. Location stuff and the HTTP stuff. Uh, most of them are convenient to wrap up around the XT core frameworks. And I mean, it's, it was all new development. It's, you know, a lot of stuff has been written the last few months, but it did the job pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, I think this one uses essentially auto layout, right? That's I, I have no one. idea. I think that's Apple's syntax with auto layout. Oh, is that what that is? Okay, cool. For motion, yeah. Like I say, there's like 40 libraries listed on that bubble um, motion wrappers page. Yeah. And lots of them. There's, these were the kind of high level ones. There's lots of them that drill down that make uh, geolocation easy or the map API really easy or, or the event interface easy. Uh, lots of stuff like that. So resources, this is, like I say, this is a book I'm working through, the iOS programming big nerd ranch guide. And also, there's a fairly recent Ruby Motion book out from Pragmatic Programmers, and I just uh, actually have this one as well uh, in electronic form. And that seems to be pretty, pretty good as well. Uh, it concentrates on Ruby Motion stuff. I think this would be a supplement to something like the Big Ranch thing, which is much more thorough in what it covers. And questions? Yes, yes. And in fact, I think a lot of the same material in the yeah. book is actually on that site. And it's very, very good. It's like a good intro. If you know Ruby or if you know Objective C, either one would be a good entry point. Yeah. Cool. How about Grand Central Dispatch? Um, I d I, I've not delved into that. If the question is, can you use it? Yes, because you, if you can use it from Objective-C, you can use it from Ruby Motion. Um, I don't know if there's any particular libraries that use it. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe some of those event things, or that's what it's using to tie in. I don't know. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So I knew there would be drone questions. <laughs>comes with an indoor hall as well. Uh, I've flown it mainly with the indoor hall because I crash into things a lot. Yeah, so, yeah, fun stuff. It's about $300. Okay, so they have a instructor how to connect the iPad, iPhone? Mm -hmm. you, you use your own iPad, iPhone, or Android device. And uh, you... And the, the pro, you download the program. The program is free. Um, hopefully, you'll get the nice program back in the App Store soon. Uh, but the, uh, the other one is functional. You can fly it with the other one as well. Uh, one lesson to learn from that is if you do get a popular app, pretty much guaranteed somebody's going to see you over something. Yeah, and I'm not sure. Okay, so, so it's, it's the press release says it was pulled from the App Store. And I don't know if Apple pulled it based upon patent complaints or if Parrot pulled it. I think they had, I think I saw some comment from them that said something about legal. I'm just assuming they, it's a bad thing because... Their, their blog post on it said, it used the passive voice, it was pulled. Because of legal patent reasons. And they're working through the legal reasons right now. That seems to say Parrot did the pulling, but I'm not sure. 
And everybody in the news groups are blaming Apple for it. Surprise. <laughs> but uh, I think it was Parrot who pulled it because of legal reasons. Yes. So you are saying if I buy this, I cannot download the app from Apple Store to play with it? You can't. You, there is an app that you can download to fly it. It's not the really nice app oh, okay. that I have. Just write your own. <laughs> or write your own. You know what? Uh, the, there is a library that uh, is an iOS library that you can write a Ruby Motion program to connect up to that library and use it. So another one of my goals when I get enough time. The, the, the library is a binary Objective-C library. So you could write Objective-C or you could write Ruby Motion. Motion hey libraries and then include those in just regular iOS projects. Hey guys, real quick, if you haven't heard of QC Merge before, this is a conference that Gaslight is hoping to put on in um, just over a month. Like, I guess just under a month. And the website's right here. It's basically a conference about um, development, design. Basically, anyone who makes a living on the web, this is a conference designed to get people in the same room to talk about it together. There's so many I have a possibilities. Free to give away tonight. It's usually <laughs> 250 bucks. Really so it's me. a pretty good deal. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if they came. Let me get my run. I think, I think we saw there. that. Yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty new to iOS development, but a lot of times you get these errors that are like, where'd this come from? Okay, so um, how do they I'm show up like one to a hundred? In the the, I mean, running Ruby Motion, yeah, you the still get some kind of five plus or minus. Still get, gets still it. Get the and I guess I should give her a fair chance. Same number. Yeah. Uh, what was our range? I'm, one Sometimes one to a hundred, zero to a hundred, plus or minus yeah. five. Um, I already got it. You already got a ticket. Yeah. Most of them themselves, I'm going to get something really cryptic. I go back. Sixty-three. Sixty-three. Uh -huh. See what I did that broke it. Okay. Just do small, small steps. Then it works faster. Than, yeah, works faster than any. Any what? Do. Yeah, but especially here. Fast. It was eighty-four. It was eighty. So um, you're closest. Hey guys, here's the code. I'm, I'm bright. You will get a free ticket.